Welcome to Nuke Radio. This is episode 12. Today is Tuesday, March 27th. We have a very special guest on the show with us today. Drew Lamb is going to be talking to us about aquaponics. But before we bring him in, we wanted to run down a couple of follow-up stories from yesterday. If you caught the fallout forecast, you may have heard that there were a few nuke events, um, two that were of critical importance. Uh, but one of these reports was really strange. The NRC reported that the Vogtel, Georgia plant, which is under construction, had a fitness for duty problem involving 20 workers who were in a pool area without the proper. The event list also said there were anomalies found in the pool area, but there wasn't any more information about that. And right on the NRC's website, it says what a fitness for duty program is. It provides reasonable assurance that nuclear facility personnel are trustworthy, will perform their tasks in a reliable manner, and are not under the influence of any substance, legal or illegal, that may impair their ability to perform their duties, and that they are not mentally or physically impaired from any cause that can adversely affect their ability to safely and competently perform their duties. So. I don't know about you, Jules, but it sounds to me like there's some kind of pool party going on there. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering that. I don't know. Well, I have a phone number. If you live by this plant and you have a safety or security concern about this story or any other stories that you've heard about new plants in the last few days, you can call 800 695 7403 and talk to someone at the NRC directly. Um, Jules has a program on Mondays, Monday nights from 10 to 12 Eastern Standard Time called WTF. And I probably would have used that story as well as this one. NHK is reporting um, that Monday a.m. at 8.30, which is probably when the workers came back from the weekend, TEPCO discovered a leak at the plant that was determined that 120 tons of highly radioactive water had leaked from some pu- from some pipes, but only 80 liters actually made it into the ocean. So my question is, if there's a 1,000 liters in a ton and there were 120 tons of water leaked, what happened to the other 119,920 liters? Evaporation. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, this, um, this water contained 140,000 becquerels per cubic centimeter of strontium. So it was highly, highly radioactive. That would have been a good story for your WTF. Yeah, it would have been. I also saw another one this morning on Fukushima Diary um, about 1.4 million becquerels per kilogram found in the nest of a swallow. Yes, I saw that too. How sad is that? Well, anyone who has any extra duct tape or garden hose, please send it to TEPCO because it sounds like they need it. Um, We had a 6.4 this morning north of Fukushima, followed by a 5.1. So you may want to keep your eye on the earthquake monitors today. The hydrogen in Reactor 2, which we reported was four times the amount in the last two weeks, is now five times. And I believe it's like almost 1% concentration and they said at four percent there was a risk of the building exploding which happened already in the suppression chamber there were some workers down there right at the start of the disaster that heard a big bang and and they think that that was an, a hydrogen hydrogen explosion uh in the containment so um the building didn't come apart in fact it's really the the only building that's still somewhat intact besides reactor five and six although we don't see them very often And also, I wanted to mention those strange Yellowstone seismographs that we were talking about yesterday. There's a guy on YouTube named Musabi009 who found a document from NOAA that said a new type of radar was being implemented called dual polarization. And they started putting these uh, radar these new radar units out in October. Several of these stations, though, are located in Billings, Montana. And he postulated that the frequencies showing up on the seismographs might be from these new radar units. 
So I don't know, check out his video and is this thing on, which is the uh, seismograph page for Yellowstone, is offline since yesterday. So uh, we want to bring Drew on. He's a friend of mine on Facebook and a fan of the show. And he recently wrote to me, and as soon as I read his email, I knew that we had to have him on here. He basically taught himself about aquaponics out of necessity and survival. He lives in a high-risk area. And what I've been saying all along is that there's a huge opportunity with this disaster for mitigation and decontamination specialists for a whole new industry to be created. It never really occurred to me how aquaponics would fit into this. But it occurred to Drew, and he's here to share his knowledge with us today about growing your own food indoors and how he is turning this into a new business endeavor for his family. So, Drew, welcome to the show. Hi, Christina. Hi, Jules. Hi, Drew. It's very nice to meet you. When did you first become concerned with what you saw going on in Fukushima? I was following the, the story of the, the earthquake and tsunami, and um, I have a cousin who lives in Hawaii, and I I'd, I'd called him and had urged him to go to high ground. There was a tsunami warning. He wasn't going to evacuate. He's grown up in coastal towns. I was just urging him to, uh, to get the heck out of Dodge and uh, go up a mountain or something. And, and that was when I started becoming very concerned about uh, the events that were taking place. Shortly thereafter, uh, one of my, my uh, friends on Facebook, my friend Todd, alerted us to the possibility of uh, fallout blowing from um, Fukushima Daiichi in the jet stream. And he was referring to... Um, fire bombs that were uh, released by the, the Japanese into the jet stream during World War II. Uh, there's a story of one landing in Oregon. We figured that this was possible and that we needed to be prepared for fallout. And so we started uh, doing research. There were, there were uh, a few of us all working together on Facebook, finding websites, uh, Geiger counter websites like Radiation Network, uh, Black Cat Systems, trying to find uh, uh, jet stream weather models like Storm Surfer and um, just putting all this information together, trying to understand what we were up against, what could happen, how bad it could be, and when it might reach us. And you said that you had had some inside info from a friend in the industry as well that something bad was going on with Reactor 3. An old childhood friend of mine uh sent me an email. Uh, she was following um, our activities on Facebook, and uh, she said that her husband, foreman up at Hanford, and that I should talk to him. So um, I gave him a call. I, I needed a Geiger counter. I, I, I'd ordered um, a Rad X dosimeter, but I, I wanted to get another Geiger counter, so I wanted to talk to him about that. He had told me that they were I extremely concerned about Reactor 3, uh, because it was a MOX fuel reactor, it was it was highly volatile, and, and they were concerned that it was going to blow up. But he didn't think that we were going to uh, get any fallout over here. He he said that those particles are too heavy, that they don't travel well, and that was the upside uh, of being that far away from from Fukushima. Um, another thing that he he told me was that um, he gets uh, periodic uh, checkups all the workers do to, to make sure that they haven't become contaminated. And um, uh, during his last checkup, um, they had uh, detected cesium-137 in his body. And um, it turned out they had to do an investigation and it turned out that he had uh, been on a hunting trip in Oregon and he had shot him uh, an elk and he'd consumed the meat and he'd gotten cesium-137 in his body from the meat. And you said in your email, too, that you already had a lot of stuff of what you needed. And we are back with uh, Drew Lamb. Drew, you had said in your email that you already had a lot of what you needed for a nuclear attack. Why is that? I, I started prepping for economic collapse back in 2008. And there, there was the, the, the bank meltdowns, uh, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and um, uh, listening to... Uh, Hank Paulson pleading for money for the banks. That was when I started uh, getting prepared for, for uh, chaos. 
that that was that was when I started looking into preparedness. It, it wasn't something I I thought a lot about, and so I, I had a, a one, one of the things I I had purchased was a, an SAS survival manual. I just happened to peruse it one evening, uh, and I'd read about nuclear preparedness in there. But it was actually it was at the bottom of my list of things that I needed to worry about. Uh, a, a lot of survivalists believe that Southern Oregon is is a very safe place to be during the during a nuclear attack or a nuclear event, but mm-hmm. that, that has been proven to be completely untrue. Um, uh, there, there are many survivalists who located here uh, uh, because of that, but, but the jet stream has really been a blind spot. You, you know, it's, it, it's, not, it's, it's not any safer than, than being near a big city, you know, or downwind of LA or Seattle or San Diego or, or someplace like that. So I had a few things. You know, I had I had six six mil plastic and duct tape and respirators and uh, storable food, water filters, uh, things like that. Um, I didn't have any Geiger counters. You know, I'd ordered that dosimeter. Um, my friend at Hanford sold me a Victorine. You know, and I, and I wanted to back up a little bit. Um, he had consumed this elk and had. Uh, gotten cesium-137 in his body, and it, it turns out that this cesium was from Chernobyl. That fallout had landed in Oregon, had been uh, taken up by the grass, elk ate the grass, he ate the elk, and it was this story that, that really, really got me concerned about the food supply and the safety of the food supply, and so I started looking into Chernobyl a little bit more and, um, uh, and, and trying to learn about the fallout pattern that happened during that. And what I learned was that the, the, the radiation was going to be uh, carried in water vapor and it was going to rain down and be concentrated in areas where it rained and snowed. Uh, we live right on, the, right on the flanks of the Western Cascades. And I, I figured that the radiation was going to pile up in the snow and we get a lot of rain and that we were going to get fallout from Fukushima in that water vapor. That was when I started being really concerned about what I was eating. What did, what advice did you give your friends when you knew that this plume was coming and that it could be heavily laden with fallout and and how did they react? I told people to get uh, uh, potassium iodide uh, to turn off their HVAC systems, to seal up their doors and windows, to stay out of the rain, uh, to avoid milk and dairy products, wash their vegetables, um, those sorts of things. Um, now the, the reaction. I mean, maybe, maybe a half dozen, maybe, maybe, maybe a dozen of my friends maximum uh, have, have shared my concern. Uh, several have just been annoyed by it all, and 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 some are are just apathetic. Others just don't want to take action because they uh, they don't think they could do anything. It's it's out of their control. You know, just go with the flow, hope for the best. I've had that kind of reaction even from physicians that I've talked to about mm-hmm. this, mm-hmm. unfortunately. One of the first things that you you and your wife, who is also very much in tune to this with you, which is wonderful that you guys support each other, you guys built a greenhouse? Yes. Um, that, that was one of the first things that, that I started to do because we – we we dug into our storable food, started eating that, um, and uh, we weren't we weren't buying produce. And some some produce I'd purchased and I tested it, and I, I was picking up um, radiation about double background in uh, produce from uh, um, California, like uh, Watsonville and uh, Salinas. You know that that's the salad bowl of, of the country over there, and yeah. and. Uh, I was picking this up with my Victorine, so I mean, th- this wasn't a high tech analysis or anything like that. But I, I, at the time, I'd say background radiation was around 15 cpm's where I live, and uh, you know, with a, a max of 30. Now it's usually about 30, with with a max around 70. And uh, I was I was picking up radiation double background in, in some vegetables, and and I had also purchased some um, uh, tomatoes from uh, Mexico um, shortly after the the beginning of the event when the jet stream was blowing on um, uh, Baja California. I got really high readings from tomatoes, so 
Um, I called up my little brother. Um, uh, he owns uh, a couple companies. Uh, one is Ladybug Indoor Gardens in Medford, and he has another company uh, that sells beneficial insects called Nature's Control. And I told him about my concerns. I wanted to build a greenhouse. Um, we grew up on a small farm, so producing our own food is kind of normal for us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, right now, I live in a suburban area, and so it's, it's not the easiest place to produce my own food. But I, I ordered a small greenhouse, um, put it together, uh, constructed some raised beds, and then um, I, I purchased a bunch of um, bagged organic soil. I knew that this stuff wasn't contaminated with the uh, with uh, uh, Fukushima fallout. It, it was bagged before that had happened, and so I, I filled my planter boxes with that, and then started planting. And another thing I did, um, I, I have sprout mix, and we got the sprout mix going. And with sprout mix, you can produce some very nutritious food with within a few days, just very quickly. And so we got that going as well. Now, a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with the term hydroponics, yes. where you you um, grow in, in tanks, um, indoors, but aquaponics is a little bit different than that, and that's what you're getting into now. Can you explain the yes. difference to us? Yes. I've been uh, getting into um, indoor gardening more and more since this event. I have a property management firm based in Ashland and uh, a friend came into my office looking for land to uh, engage in aquaponics. He gave me a bunch of research on it that opened my eyes to um, a whole new possibility for producing food in a controlled and uh, uh, much safer environment than outdoors. And you're using, um, there's catfish, perch, bass, tilapia that can be put into the system and you mentioned trout also? Yes, yeah, so what what you have is a a, a a system. It's it's a it's a closed system. So it's not like typical aquaculture. Um, uh, aquaculture fish runs are usually located near streams and rivers, and they'll they'll flush them out periodically, and it can contaminate the stream or the river and raise temperatures. And with this, it, this isn't. It, it's not the case. It's a closed system. You have your fish run like a tank. Okay, um, hold that thought. We'll be back in a moment and we'll continue talking with Drew. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Here we are back with Nuked Radio and we're talking to Drew Lamb, who's teaching us about aquaponics. And all you really need to get started growing your own food indoors is electricity, water, and a fish tank. Drew, you had um, you were talking to Jules and I off air about the uptake with some research that you found out about uptake in plants. What did you learn helps block cesium and strontium? Well, I, I'd been uh, doing some research on soil amendments that would help um, block the uh, phyto extraction of cesium-137 uh, from the soil by plants. And, and I'd found a few studies um, where uh, researchers had mixed um, composted manure and um, ammonium nitrate. They, they were actually trying to uh, increase phyto extraction to clean up contaminated sites, and they'd found that the, uh, this combination had uh, reduced the uptake of cesium-137 by, by their test plants. Um, it, it turns out that the reason for this is that the ammonium nitrate speeds up uh, the release of uh, calcium and potassium uh, that's contained in the manure. These elements compete with the cesium-137 for uptake by the plants. So wh what they learned from this was that mixing these together would uh, reduce uh, phyto extraction of cesium-137 by 40 to 60 percent. That's a huge amount. So um, uh, further tests revealed that um, primarily calcium uh, was blocking the uptake and um, um, in addition to potassium, uh, magnesium also blocks the uptake too, but primarily calcium. You could just add calcium 
to soil and they'd done tests where they'd added calcium to soil a couple weeks before harvest and uh, had reduced cesium already contained in the plants by a factor of three. You could take already contaminated crops and, and reduce the amount of cesium that's in them and you could also help block the, the phyto extraction of cesium-137 by the plants. And, and you could take this a step further. I, I was thinking that you could apply a, a, a calcium amendment to, to grass where you're gonna be grazing cattle a couple weeks before you, you put the cattle out and um, help reduce the, the amount of cesium-137 that's uh, contained in uh, grass-fed beef. This could be done with corn crops too, I would imagine. Well, it's really interesting because it is not only the fallout that lands on top of the crops that we have to worry about, but what they are uptaking into their roots and into the plant itself. So exactly. that's going to become very important. And I've felt for a while now that really the safest food is going to be the food that you grow yourself where you control the air, the water, the soil. But you had some ideas also for growing outside, am I correct, using trusses? Yeah, well, I, I've been trying to think of ways that people could get into this without spending uh, um, a lot of money. You know, if um, and, and I'll back up a little bit. With, with the aquaponics, what you're trying to do is uh, produce fish, vegetables, and nutrients for your plants using as little resources as possible. And, and so you don't have a lot of energy inputs into that kind of a system. It's, it, it's extremely efficient and it doesn't use as much water as standard agriculture because you're recirculating your water. The, the plants process the fish waste, use the nutrients, clean up the water for the fish. Um, after nine months or so, um, you have fish. And, um, and you could construct um, a, a, a three-tier aquaponics system just, just out of wood and um and pond liner and and you need a pump and and i would encourage people to go to uh sweetwater organics or uh, growing power you just search this on on facebook or on your favorite search engine and um also check out uh murray hallam in australia he, he's an aquaponics pioneer and I, I i've learned a lot from studying his his techniques now um growing outside um, you know, is is really risky because you've got all this fallout, and, and sometimes, I mean, we've we both have noticed we've we've gotten increased uh, Geiger counts even when there's there's no clouds or rain. So sometimes stuff's just blowing in the wind, but most most often um, it, it's in the water vapor. Uh, my Geiger counter was hitting 66 CPMs today, and it was really stormy this morning. And uh, so what you want to do is to be able to cover your plants and, and, and also you want, to, you want to keep them out of the groundwater. So you, you, you need to construct a raised bed. You need to have some way to, um, so I, I would use uh, some bagged organic soil or worm castings. Um, I, I know that over at Ladybug Indoor Gardens, um, Nathan has some uh, worm castings that were uh, bagged before Fukushima. So okay. they're not going to have that kind of fallout radiation on them. And then you could take something like you could just bend some pipe, like some PVC pipe, and arch it over the top of your raised beds. And then just take some uh, six mil plastic and pull it over the top uh, of your planting beds when it's going to rain. And you want to secure it so the wind doesn't blow it off. Um, a another neat idea that I saw was a, a guy had taken uh, field fencing and had uh, made an arch out of it. And he made what was called a low tunnel, also known as a, a caterpillar. And um, you just set that over the top of your growing bed, and then you pull your plastic over the top, and you've got a miniature greenhouse right there. And you can keep your vegetables um, out of the black rain. And it's much, much less expensive, of course, too, than, than um, building a greenhouse. Yeah. And Jules, you, you guys built a greenhouse too, right? Yeah, last spring we did, um, just because, you know, I, I realized that anything we'd be growing in the ground would get contaminated. Um, and we did it with just two by fours and, uh, you know, some of that thick, uh, opaque plastic. Mm -hmm. We built a frame um, on the deck and uh, stapled the plastic up, and it did great last year. Good sun, and um, I still have two 50-pound bags of topsoil that are contained inside the greenhouse so i'm hoping this year too to get something going 
but it was only a few hundred dollars for all the parts. I mean, it wasn't that expensive, and uh, it lasted through the winter just fine. Not one rip, actually. Um, Drew, you all this research that you've been doing about growing in aquaponics, you guys are actually taking this a step further now, and you're starting a business, right? Yeah. Um, I, I have two reasons for doing this. Well, three reasons. One, I, I, I really enjoy this kind of work. I, I found working in my greenhouse, I, I, I'm just very content and enjoy doing the work. I, I could easily spend my entire weekend on this stuff. Uh, don't, don't even realize what time it is. It, time just flies. And uh, so I, I enjoy the work. I like producing good, clean food. I, I like the variety of vegetables that I could have year round. I've been expecting food prices to, to just explode. And I, I've been planning on this for, for about a year. The Federal Reserve continues to print more money and uh, debase the dollar. We're, we're going to see inflation. We're seeing inflation already. And, and I believe that these uh, spikes we're seeing in, in gas prices are, are uh, due to uh, a devalued dollar, not, not so much uh, anything to do with uh, the, the supplier demand of, of fuel. I think that if you have a community that is uh, self-sufficient and can produce its own food, if, if there's a major economic catastrophe, um, your community will be stable. Your community won't be looking to the government, won't be looking to FEMA for help. Your community won't need it. I've found aquaponics as, as a way to produce a lot of food in an efficient way. And it's, it's a fun and exciting activity, and um, I'd like to teach other people how to do it. Being a property manager, I, I operate many types of properties, and uh, that includes agricultural land and warehouse properties. And so I had a couple sites that where my clients were, were open to my doing this. And so, so I'm working on setting up um, uh, some aquaponics. Uh, out on a farm outside of Ashland, and then I, I'm working on uh, setting up um, more aquaponics as well as uh, processing and cold storage at, at another site in Ashland. Well, I really like how just using your common sense and, and doing your own research and being very proactive that you've gotten into this to the level that you have. How can people find your information if they have questions after the show today? Um, your, you know, your blog or your, your company, how can they connect with you? And we are back with Nuked Radio, and Drew was just giving out his contact info, and I think we got cut off on the break. Drew, go ahead and give it to us again. If you guys want to contact me with questions, you can email me, Drew, D-R-E-W, at medfordbrothers.com, M-E-D-F-O-R-D, brothers.com. I wanted to ask you, too, what observations you've made in your area of the country, which I consider high risk, and some of that's been confirmed by some of the recent uh, USGS publications of iodine-131 fallout. Um, what kind of clues in nature are you seeing or illnesses or sick pet stories? What are you hearing from people around you? One thing that I noticed early on was uh, high Geiger counts in uh, puddles of water after it rained. I, I was... I was getting Geiger counts that were between 60 and 88 CPMs in standing water in my yard when, when background radiation was, was under 30 CPMs. That clued me in to, to the fact that it wasn't the water vapor and we were getting fallout in the rain. Uh, I had also noticed um, in, in the early days of this, this, this is probably in April or May of last year, um, a metallic taste in my mouth. Another friend of mine who pays attention to this um, had complained of the same thing. I, I thought it was the, the kelp supplements that I was taking. Now I think it was cesium-137 that I was tasting, and, and I've, I've heard this complaint all over the place. Christina yes. and I both had the same thing as well as my husband, and it was like at the end of March, beginning of April last year. Mm -hmm. We all had metallic tastes. Yeah. We had it again here in July, too, for about a week, really bad. I, I think that's the cesium-137. I'd, I'd heard reports of this in, in Japan, too. It, it, as far as uh, sick pets go, um, last November, uh, we had, uh, we had a, a real severe rainstorm. I, I think it was November 15th. And um, uh, I turned on the, the Victorine. I've got a Victorine uh, uh, CDV700. And I can open the probe up. There's a shield on the probe. And I, I could uh, test for... Uh, 
beta particles and uh, gamma rays with it. And so I'd open it up, I turned it on to see what, it, what, what was going on. And I just happened to get up to get a drink of water and I glanced down and the, the, the needle was buried at 300 CPMs. And I, and I went to change scales to see where I was really at. And then it, it fell to zero, I, I think, because the, the tube got flooded. Okay. Um, the next day, my in-laws said that um, a, a cow out at their property had miscarried. And um, they lease out uh, one of their pastures to a cattleman. And um, my father-in-law and the cattleman were, were out there um, uh, dealing with the calf. They, they were burying it. And uh, the, the cattleman started to feel sick and he got really hot and uh, took his shirt off and wasn't feeling well. He had to go to the hospital. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. And then um, recently, uh, two of their dogs have, have become ill. One of them had to be put down. She had uh, cancer in her neck. Um, the other dog was uh, bleeding out of her ears. So I, I don't know if this is due to radioactive fallout. I, I'm sure they're listening right now. Um, I, I suspect that it is. I hope it's not. <laughs> but but I think it's it's very possible. I wanted to um, ask you, too, because I noticed a, a couple people saying in chat they don't really have money to build a greenhouse or do anything on kind of a, a large scale or even a medium scale. What could somebody do like me? I live in an apartment. It's very small, um, but I definitely have room for a, a big fish tank in here near a window. What could people do on a small scale that would be inexpensive in their own well, house? I, I think, you know, on a small scale, I think that your, your, your best bet on a small scale would be to, to uh, do sprouts, sprouting. You could just, I mean, you could do wheat sprouts. Uh, alfalfa sprouts, radish sprouts, uh, wheatgrass, things like that. But with with a good sprout mix, you can produce some very nutritious food. You can do it in your kitchen. It's it's hardly going to cost anything. You can probably get trays to do it in for free at, at your local garden store. As far as going aquaponics in your house with a fish tank, you're, you're gonna you're gonna run into uh, problems with with cleaning up the water um, uh, sufficiently. Um, uh, small systems can be really unstable and, and difficult to uh, uh, tune in. You've got to have a good nitrogen cycle. You, you need enough plants in, in order to clean up that water and have have a good stable nitrogen cycle. And so that's we're doing it on a on a small scale. Like inside of your house could, could be challenging. But if if you look at uh, Murray Hallam's videos, you, you can find him on on YouTube. Uh, he shows some home based setups and. And you can put something together by just framing up some some plywood and with some two by fours and some pond liners and some gravel and and put together a three tier system, you know, with with scrap wood. Really, it, it is possible. But but if, if you're on a budget, you probably wouldn't want to go with the aquaponics kind of setup, you know. And, and another thing you might want to do is get together with other people and do a, a community garden and uh, pool resources. Um, and could you could you do this like in somebody's basement, like with the right lighting? Yes, you could. Um, and, and like Jules and I were talking during the break about um, uh, using LEDs, really low energy consumption. I, I, I bought some over at Ladybug Indoor Gardens that, that only consume, uh, you get three sets of lights and the, the, the whole strip consumes eight watts. I could run the whole upper tier of my lights in my greenhouse on, on, um, on a small solar power circuit. Um, that, that's really the way to go, um, I, I think. And, uh, um, and if you're going to do that inside, you, you could either grow in soil or you could do um, hydroponics. But if, if you're going with hydroponics, you're going to have a pump. Um, if the power goes out, uh, that pump's not going to work. And so I think if you're on a budget, I, I would go with uh, uh, using, using um, organic soil as, as your medium. I would also use... I recommend this for everybody. Add a product called CalMag to to your watering tea or to your irrigation water. It's uh, calcium, magnesium, and iron. This will work to uh, block the cesium-137. And also in plants like spinach that are rich in calcium and magnesium, this helps to, to protect you as well. I was watching a video with Dr. Christopher Busby where he was talking about supplements, and he was uh, recommending that people – 
uh, take supplements with calcium and magnesium to help uh, protect your bones from uh, taking in strontium-90. You're uh, watering with calcium and magnesium. Your plants, especially spinach, are going to take this up. You eat those plants, and you get the benefit of that. I saw that video from him as well, and as soon as I saw it, even though the recommendations weren't really just for children in Japan, I started my family on it too, and, and I actually found a supplement through my doctor's office, which has uh, the calcium and magnesium together, and with three of us in the house taking it every day, it's like 20 bucks a year. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's really cheap, but then you're getting it from the plants too if you're fortifying them. It's inexpensive. This. And, and I'd like to say, you know, I, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist. Uh, I, I'm a caveman in the nuclear age trying to build tools to survive. And that's kind of what we're all doing. A lot of people listening to this show, we were talking about earlier, you know, everything that we've learned, we've had to really teach ourselves out of necessity and out of curiosity. So um, some, some of the people like on Radiation Watch, they call us basement scientists. Mm-hmm. You know, it is a fascinating subject. Fukushima almost made the subject cool, where it wasn't before. But uh, it's also going to be probably one of the most important subjects that you ever study to get a handle on what's happening and how to mitigate for it. And without help from our EPA and our FDA and the USDA, you know, we, we have to make a lot of these uh, decisions on our own. You had actually even another idea about clothing that might be beneficial for people living in high-risk areas? Well, wh one thing that I've learned is that um, uh, alpha particles, those, uh, those are from alpha emitters, you know, like plutonium, uranium, americium-241. Mm -hmm. the uh, hot they're particles. Pretty, they're pretty big, and, and, and they're, they're easy to block. They, they typically won't penetrate your skin, but, but um, uh, you can block them with paper or nylon, plastic, so nylon clothing. But what I found is... If you could get Pertex clothing, it's, it's ripstop nylon coated with aluminum. You could also get sleeping bags made out of this stuff. You could have some, theoretically, you could have some protection from both alpha particles and beta particles. And my Geiger counters, I, I've got an Inspector EXP. I could detect alpha with it. Most of the radiation that I've detected with my counters, I, I, I believe to be uh, uh, beta particles. Uh -huh. And and so, um, I got a really cool North Face coat um, that's uh, made out of Pertex, and uh, I like to believe it protects me. <laughs> well, so. Drew, I really appreciate you coming on today and sharing your information with us. If you guys just search aquaponics on YouTube, um, you can see some videos from Purdue showing the process that Drew talked about today, and thank you so much for being a guest, and we would love to have you back. And especially Anytime. to hear how, how your business is going. I'll make videos. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll be back tomorrow with Stephen Moyer from Radiation Health Solutions, where we uh, continue this discussion. You've been listening to Nuked Radio. Thanks, Jules. See you guys tomorrow.